Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and today we're going to go over all the historical deviations in part 2 of our Let's Talk Lore Trivi Trilogy. This part of the lore series started with Lu Su making a visit to Liu Bei to test the waters to see if a potential Liu Bei and Sun Quan alliance was possible. Most of this first episode was historically accurate as Lu Su personally believed that Wu was built for grander things. When he first joined Wu, he advocated for Wu to expand to all territory south of the Yangtze River and then use the land in the south to create their own kingdom. So it makes sense that Lu Su would try to promote this alliance as there were many other voices at the time in the south that leaned towards surrendering to Cao Cao and the hostage Han Dynasty. The only thing that was incorrect in the books was that Lu Su arrived at Liu Bei's camp right at the end of Liu Bei's massive defeat at Changban, instead of when Liu Bei had already escaped to the safety of Jiangxia. But this is a very minor deviation, and the result of Lu Su's visit is the same. Liu Bei agrees and sends Zhuge Liang as an emissary to lobby on his behalf in the Wu court. Now, our next episode covered Zhuge Liang's exciting debates with the Wu court, but this was mostly literary flair added by the author to highlight his own mastery of writing. Of course, Zhuge Liang would have to have debated and lobbied for the alliance since Zhang Zhao and many others in the Wu court were in fact strongly in favor of surrendering, but history tend to only record results and the details of such debate are long lost. And we have to take a look at why Zhang Zhao wants to surrender. After all, Sun Ce entrusted him and Zhou Yu to take care of Sun Quan, so how could their opinion differ so much? Well, I would argue that the surrendering faction in Wu has very sound logic. At the time, if we look at the map, Cao Cao is riding high of wiping off Yuan Shao in the north and capturing the Jin province without bloodshed in the south, as Liu Cong had just surrendered. The result of these two moves extended to all the other warlords at the time. Gong Sun Kang in the northeast bent the knee and became a vassal to preserve himself. Liu Zhang, in the Shu region, also started providing tributes and conscripts to Cao Cao's army following the surrender of Jin. Ma Teng and Han Sui, in the northwest, also expressed their loyalty to the Han court to Cao Cao. So if you look at the map, everyone has basically stopped resisting, except for Liu Bei. Now I'd like to note that Zhang Lu is a very special case, and we'll talk about him in a separate lore series, a very short one because he's a very interesting character, as he, he essentially had his own cult. But back to our story. Um, so only person resisting is Liu Bei. So at this time, Sun Quan's decision is very critical, because if they decide to surrender, Liu Bei will be surrounded on all sides by enemies, and Cao Cao would have likely wiped him out and united China right there and then. But Sun Quan was persuaded by Zhuge Liang, Lu Su, and Zhou Yu, who all for various reasons wanted to fight. Zhuge Liang's reason is quite simple, as he and Liu Bei needed Sun Quan's help for self-preservation. Lu Su had grand ambitions for Wu, like we just said. For Zhou Yu though, the reason is a bit more complicated. He was not enraged by any poems written by Cao Cao's son Cao Zhi about the two bridges, which can be stretched to imply the Da Qiao and Xiao Qiao, as the word Qiao was the same character for Da Qiao and Xiao Qiao's name and used for the word bridge at the time. But to understand why Zhou Yu would insist on fighting, we have to go all the way back to Zhou Yu's childhood. Both he and Sun Ce, Sun Quan's older brother, were born in the same year, one month apart. Both were well-known child prodigies from big clans. So the two of them bonded at a young age. When Sun Jian, first became a warlord and had to leave his family to fight all over the place. Zhou Yu invited Sun Ce and Lady Wu to come live with his family in Lujiang as it was safer for them. After Sun Jian's death, when Sun Ce started over to become a warlord himself, Zhou Yu sold his fortunes to recruit troops to join Sun Ce, and the two of them basically conquered and created what Wu was at the time. Sadly, Sun Ce was assassinated at a young age of 26. This was a huge blow to the Sun clan, and it was also a big blow to Zhou Yu himself. 
as Sun Quan was still very young at the time. So Sun Ce left Zhang Zhao and Zhou Yu to guide his younger brother, who was just ranked as a general at the time, as the Sun clan were not big enough or strong enough to be considered their own faction. But despite this, Zhou Yu treated the young Sun Quan as a lord and guided him to a position that we see him in today, as the lord of the six commanderies in the south. In a sense, Zhou Yu felt a strong bond with Sun Ce and saw himself as part of the Sun family, and Lady Wu also treated him as a son. Sun Quan was also told to treat Zhou Yu as a bigger brother, and he would always give him special treatment. Historically, it was recorded that Sun Quan would give Zhou Yu hundreds of new clothes annually, which was a big luxury item at the time. So Zhou Yu was both loyal and ambitious as he wanted to help expand Wu and the Sun clan. Given all these conditions, Wu's decision to give it a shot and join Liu Bei to resist Cao Cao was pretty much made. And also, Zhou Yu made the accurate estimate that Cao Cao's army isn't really as big as he claimed. So that brings us to another point here. How big exactly was Cao Cao's force in the Battle of Chibi? In history and in the novel, Cao Cao wrote Sun Quan a letter in the beginning of the war asking him to surrender. In this letter, he claimed that he had an army of over 800,000 strong. In the novel, the number 830,000 is repeatedly referenced, but this is a gross estimation of Cao Cao's actual numbers. Zhou Yu's estimation of 200,000 to 250,000 is probably a much more accurate number. Of this group, around 150,000 came with Cao Cao from the north. This is Cao Cao's core group. The other came from the Jin province troop that surrendered, which included a 70,000 to 80,000 naval unit. This was the core group of the Battle of Chibi itself, as Cao Cao didn't have a navy before. Most of the land army that Cao Cao had actually didn't even encamp at Chibi at the time, because Cao Cao had to leave a lot of his forces scattered throughout the Jin province as he feared that if he didn't leave a strong enough military presence in some areas, then it was likely that some loyalists would rebel, as they were those who opposed the initial surrender. So many of his best generals, like Yue Jin and Xia Houdun, were absent at the Battle of Chibi, and we never mention them in our lore series, as they were garrisoned at the time in Xiangyang and Jiangling. So the actual size of Cao Cao's army at the battle itself was probably closer to just 100,000 to maybe 150,000. Conversely, Liu Bei had 20,000 men and Zhou Yu had 30,000 men. So the numbers disadvantage was still there, but it was definitely not as bad as the novel suggested. If it was really that lopsided, I don't think the fire attack would have made much of a difference. A lot of our lore series also featured some exciting battle of wits between Zhou Yu and Zhuge Liang. While these were exciting stories, they were mostly fictional. Zhuge Liang and Zhou Yu's battle of wit didn't actually happen until after the battle of Chibi, where they will be a key part of our story in part 3 of our lore series going forward. But many of their exploits in the novel before the battle of Chibi were based on real events. For example, when Zhuge Liang had to make arrows, he used the empty boats to pick up arrows fired by Cao Cao. This was loosely based on a real event where Sun Quan actually borrowed arrows using boats from Cao Cao. Also, the plan to use a fire attack was not an idea that originated from Zhou Yu or Zhuge Liang, but rather it came from Huang Gai after he noticed that Cao Cao had linked their ships together to fight off seasickness. And this idea to link ship together also didn't come from Pang Tong, as he was just a neutral scholar at the time who didn't work for anyone. The idea probably most likely came from Tai Mao, as he was the one in charge of training the navy. Speaking of Tai Mao, we need to talk about a clown comedy relief character in our story in Jiang Gan. In our lore series, Jiang Gan played a role as a spy who got repeatedly played by Zhou Yu, which resulted in the death of Cai Mao and Zhang Yun. But this was not the case in history. At the start of the war, Cao Cao wanted to try to convince Zhou Yu to join his side, since as we have repeatedly stated, 
Cao Cao values talent beyond anything, so he wanted the famous Zhou Yu. To achieve this, Cao Cao wrote a very sincere letter to invite Zhou Yu to a neutral site in the south, in Yangzhou, where Jiang Gan will act as Cao Cao's proxy to try to lobby Zhou Yu to ditch Wu and join Cao Cao. Now, why was Jiang Gan chosen? Who was Jiang Gan? We had said, and the novel has said, he was a former classmate of Zhou Yu from the same hometown, but this was not the case as he was much older. Jiang Gan was picked by Cao Cao because he was a world-renowned debater at the time, so Cao Cao paid good money for him to try to persuade Zhou Yu on his behalf. Some of the story were still true, as when Jiang Gan and Zhou Yu met, Zhou Yu ended up taking Jiang Gan back with him to his camp to show off the strength of Wu's navy and all the wealth that Sun Quan has gifted him to tell Jiang Gan that he will never surrender as he has a strong enough force to resist and a lord that loves him. After seeing all this, Jiang Gan returned to Cao Cao and returned the payment he received as he told Cao Cao that Zhou Yu will never surrender and he can't take this job. So this also means Cai Mao and Zhang Yun were never killed by Cao Cao. In fact, a lot of people who Cao Cao stated to have killed in the novel were actually never killed. For example, earlier in part one, we talked about how Liu Cong and Lady Cai surrendered and then were executed, but in history, they were never killed after their surrender. But if Cao Cao had all these capable naval officers, then how did he lose at Battle of Chubi? This is a pretty tough question to answer in a short fashion and can probably be a separate video by itself, but I'll try my best to talk about what happened in history and give a little bit of my analysis and opinion on what happened. First, when Cao Cao arrived at the Yangtze River, he tried to use his newly acquired Jin Province Navy to make a crossing for the river right away, as he knew this natural barrier was going to ruin his fight. But the first battle they fought on the river, just like in the novel and in history, Cao Cao's forces were soundly defeated by Zhou Yu's navy, and Cao Cao came to realize that the Jin navy were no match for Wu's navy. This defeat was extra bad for Cao Cao, as he essentially forced him to camp across from Chibi, which is a mountain on the Wu side of the river, in a heavily forested area called Wuling, as Zhou Yu won the naval showdown and essentially sealed the river away from Cao Cao. This early defeat and the loss of confidence in the Jin navy eventually led to linking of the ships, which gave Huang Gai the opening for a fire attack. Huang Gai, in fact, did fake a surrender to kick off the final attack at Battle of Chibi, but he didn't take a beating and sell that he was mistreated. He simply wrote a letter to Cao Cao asking for a higher rank, and desperate for a way to beat the Wu army, Cao Cao relented and believed it. Also, Kan Zhe didn't play any part in delivering this letter, as a no-name person did the job, as it was very high risk, and that person, whoever it is in history, did a very good job of withstanding a suspicious Cao Cao's questionings. Another factor we have to consider here is that Cao Cao's army at the time were suffering from a lot of illness. Climate difference between the north and south was a key reason here, but there were other factors at play too. If we look Cao Cao marched out first against Liu Bei in this war in the late summer of 208, and by the time he got bogged down on the north bank of the Yangtze River, it was already November, so his army was poorly prepared for a winter campaign. This probably contributed to the illness as well as local weather conditions. But you can imagine, Cao Cao's side consisted mainly of surrendered Jin naval forces, who took a few bad beatings from the Wu Navy early on, add on the illness, add on the fire attack that happened on the night of the final assault, and we can easily see how Cao Cao's massive force crumbled during that epic showdown in Shibi. Speaking of the night attack, the easterly wind that we described in our last episode played a big role in ensuring the success of a fire attack, but the wind change itself had nothing to do with Zhuge Liang's prayer or sorcery, weather just happened. Now, we talked a lot about Zhou Yu and Cao Cao, so what about Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei? In most of the Battle of Chibi, Liu Bei was a bystander. Despite having around 20,000 men, with half of it being a navy, Liu Bei only deployed his men as pursuit units following Zhou Yu's successful fire attack on Cao Cao, and Cao Cao's escape that we described 
were also not so dramatic either, as he still had many men in reserve throughout his escape route, as we said the bulk of his force were not at Trubi itself. He also didn't laugh three times and get ambushed three times by Zhuge Liang's well-planned assignments, but that story was also not entirely made up, as he did laugh one time in history at Hua Rongdao, which was unguarded at the time. But as soon as he laughed, Liu Bei's forces did show up behind him and chase him through the pass, so some of that story is true. Also, note that I just said that Hua Rongdao was unguarded, as Guan Yu was not assigned there to wait on Cao Cao. But what was true about Hua Rongdao was that it was a very poorly maintained hiking path, and the conditions that morning was very bad to the point where Cao Cao basically used his injured and weak and old troops to line up the road to try to fix the trail and have his cavalry kind of just drive through. And it resulted in a lot of trampling, death of his own injured men, where he didn't really care about it as he really needed to get his main force out of there. So it was not a pleasant retreat by all means, but it was not so terrible where he was getting killed left and right. Now, what did Guan Yu do during this fight? Well, Guan Yu didn't do anything during this fight at Tribi, as he was in charge of the navy portion of Liu Bei's forces, and Liu Bei simply didn't deploy his navy for this battle. But culturally speaking, the story of Guan Yu guarding Hua Rongdao left a huge impact, as this popular puzzle game shown here was invented in China and promptly named Hua Rongdao. I am very sure that many of you have played similar version of this game where you try to get the big block through the little blocks to leave from this puzzle, but I bet many of you didn't know this was an ancient Chinese puzzle game that was made in reference to Cao Cao's escape as Hua Rongdao. As we can see, the big square unit is labeled Cao Cao. And the reason why Cao Cao ended up running away in the direction of Hua Rongdao was not because Zhou Yu had assigned people all over the place like we discussed, but rather if we look at the map here, if he had ran straight north, he would have ran into another river, the Han River, and he can't cross that river. So his only choice was to run west, to get to Jiangling or Nanjun, as they called it back then, as quickly as he can, before Zhou Yu cuts him off by sailing to Jiangling, following the Battle of Chibi. Then he can safely turn north, and regroup with many of his reserve forces that never went to Chibi itself in Jinzhou and Xiangyang. Now this part of the story is mainly in part 3 of our lore series, so I feel like we're at a good stopping point here, as we have covered most of the historical deviation in part 2 of our trilogy, and cleared up many of the factors that caused Cao Cao's defeat at Chibi. At the end here, I want to add something that was not mentioned in the book or our lore series, but historically, Right when Cao Cao took over the Jin province from Liu Tong's surrender, his strategist Jia Xu, who recently got his own portrait in the game, suggested to Cao Cao to not pursue Liu Bei. He argued that if Cao Cao simply spent some time to govern the Jin province and incorporate the people and those loyal to Liu Biao fully into his control, then the South can be won without actually fighting. By not pressuring Liu Bei and Sun Quan with force right away, the two of them would likely have fought each other instead of united against Cao Cao. If Cao Cao had just stayed in Xiangyang and waited, he could have flexed harder than actually driving his force down the Yangtze River to fight Zhou Yu in a naval combat, which was Zhou Yu's strength. The soft pressure that he would have generated would have allowed those inside Wu who favored surrendering to eventually convince Sun Quan that the best option he have is to kill Liu Bei and use Liu Bei's head to sue for a favorable vassalage under Cao Cao, and perhaps the three kingdoms that we have come to know would never have happened, and China would have united there and then, and the Han dynasty might have continued for a while longer until Cao Cao eventually usurped. We'll never know, as Cao Cao was overconfident, and very eager to end the war to unite China right away after years of fighting. But because of Cao Cao's heir, we get to have three kingdoms as a great source material for these great stories and games. So hopefully you have enjoyed this video. If you have any farther questions or if you feel like I missed some points, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. Also, please like, subscribe, and share this video to support the channel. And I'll see y'all in part three of the lore series starting tomorrow. Bye!